Hello, and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, Licensed Professional Counselor. Today's episode is episode 20. I'm going to be reflecting on my 10 years of providing psychotherapy. I'm going to be discussing where this process can take a person, not only as a provider of psychotherapy, but as a client. And I'm going to be discussing further what my aim and focus is in my next part of my career. So, part one on reflections of 10 years of working as a psychotherapist. That part is going to be my personal reflections on learning and how I got to become a psychotherapist and then what I learned after. Part two is going to be reflections on my experience with a lot of different modalities in therapy and their implications. Of course, these are going to be a lot of my opinions, and I hope you learn a lot today. So, part one, my personal reflections. While the Intentional Clinician podcast is a demystification of psychology and counseling, and I aim to encourage people to engage in their own inner work and to understand that if they work at it, they can have a better life, there are many layers leading both up and down. Eventually, there is an importance to understand that the, quote, answer will never be the cure. The human mind cannot believe something 100%. Of that, I am very convinced. So a balance must be achieved between the polar opposites of pessimism and optimism, between rightness and facts and so-called truths and the mysteries of life, new discoveries that obliterate old facts and a myriad of ambiguities that flow in and out of our lives. Which is the right path? What should I choose? Well, we must exist in both. There is a need to remystify our lives and bring us out of this linear, chronological, orderly place that our mind tries to create. Because this place, when taken to the extreme, may become regressive and repressive until we are locked into a certain viewpoint. We must move to an expansive place, both in and outside of a container, where images and symbols take on more meaning than the numbers, and the felt sense, feelings, and subtle impressions that make up the stuff of life both precognitive and pre-linguistic, allow us to thrive in this mystery called life in this universe. To understand what I am talking about at all, I must take you through the basics of counseling and psychology from how I learned it and discuss a variety of treatments, as well as my journey into depth psychology. I will discuss my own story at first in this podcast and how I found the field of counseling as I reflect on my 10 years as psychotherapist since 2008, now in 2018. And I'm going to talk about how I spent my time working with clients in sessions. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I am not done learning. I hope I will never be done learning. Part of my mission in life from a young age was not to grow cynical or bitter, but to seek to evolve and soak up experiences. It was one of my mantras during college as I noticed so many middle-aged adults that I found myself in contact with finding a plateau of knowledge or perspective or opinion and seeming to just settle in and watch the fire and enjoy the firelight. And that's fine. I think there's a time for enjoying, but I also found that the perspectives were not growing in my impression at that time. So for whatever reason, the quote, good life or just settling in and having a nice life and being contented with my chateau or whatever you want to call it. It never really appealed to me. Shangri-La, I think, is the, is the kink song I was referring to right there. I wanted to experience more and live more, and so I set out on a course. This came at a tremendous financial sacrifice as I lived in cheap and basic quarters from my early 20s all the way until I was married. My wife had many different ideas about how we should be living and in what sort of quarters we should be living. Uh, But she is also a lifelong learner as well and refuses to stop learning and evolving. So our partnership works. I may not be the most talented person in any single realm of psychotherapy, of writing, of podcast recording, of singing, of songwriting, or piano playing, but dang it, I'm not going to quit at anything. So before I start with my story, here's a quote by Carl Jung. Small and hidden is the door that leads inward 
and the entrance is barred by countless prejudices, mistakes, assumptions, and fears. To go inward is difficult. I will discuss the inner journey, especially in the last part of today's podcast, so stay tuned. So here is some of my history about how I got into counseling and the field of counseling. A lot of this I covered in episode one, but here's a brief little summary. As you may remember in episode one, when I was young, I lived in a motel, uh, actually all the way until I was 18, from about age five. And as such, I talked to many different people from many different backgrounds, almost constantly. I officially worked in the motel, checking in guests and doing various tasks about the place from about age 11 to until I was 24 years old. I used to come home from college in the summer and work there. This opened my mind to the differences of people and the nuances, but also a lot of things that people had in common uh, that you kind of had to wait for, as a lot of people had a shell or a persona that they were projecting. In addition to this experience, I attended many different schools in many different districts. This was for a variety of issues that I won't get into. My parents brought me to many different places of worship, different types of churches, from extreme right-wing kind of perspective, literalism, fundamentalism, to extreme left-wing and to something in the middle, uh, all over the place. I, I probably... I can't even estimate, but I, I think I went to at least 15 churches by the time I was somewhere in my teenage years. Eventually, during college, I became a mentor for the university I was living with, which was sort of a resident assistance uh, position, but I was not really enforcing rules. It was more of a, a, a counseling type thing, a faux counseling thing. And I spent about a year and a half doing that. I also worked in high schools and middle schools as a volunteer, and eventually, when I graduated high, uh, college, I became a substitute teacher because I didn't really want to go full-time into the position. During this time, I had many personal struggles myself, dealing with anxiety, uh, attention issues, a few big bouts of depression, family turmoil, death, loss, and grief. I was quite ill-prepared for all of these, and oddly, I did not even really know counseling was an option. Um, I thought counseling, or assumed counseling, was for people who were not really functioning at all, and oddly, I was able to quote-unquote function through most of this personal turmoil. Though, when I reflect, I see that I was not quite functioning to my, clo uh, my fullest potential at all. I mean, I was barely getting through, but I was getting through, and I, you know, grades mattered and all of that, and so I kept going. Um, and, you know, obviously... Even though I'd been to a diversity of churches, you know, they didn't really emphasize counseling. You were supposed to, you know, just pray and all of a sudden magically things would turn around. During that period, I uh, coped by swimming. I played in a band. I played music with my friends. I kept in touch with many friends who had moved out of the area. I was very highly social and I read a lot of books and magazines. Eventually, various disappointing events regarding my career uh, attempts in music led me to another thing called uh, psychology and counseling. I took a few career placement tests and talked to many professors about this. They recognized my gift for caring and for talking with people, but I still had trouble listening. I could learn this, they told me. So, for all of you out there who have trouble listening, you can learn that. I couldn't really stand classroom management, and I had difficulty with some of the ways I was told to educate children in my education program at university. And so um, I debated going back into getting my full psychology bachelor's, but I was, I was a couple classes away, but they wanted to charge me extra for completing them because I had quote-unquote graduated in May, even though I was asking them in June and July to take these two extra psych courses. So anyway, I found a master's program that thought I had taken enough psychology courses, as it was, as it was my quote, minor. So I enrolled in uh, that program. And then things really got strange. So many things changed, but I moved to this great city of Chicago, Illinois, which I still love, and I have a lot of history there, a lot of family there, a lot of friends there still, and try to visit often. Um, and... Uh, but, you know, moving out of your comfort zone from a medium-sized college town where I had grown up 
and gone to college uh, to a gigantic metropolis was one of the most difficult things I had ever done. I was completely outside of my comfort zone, and living in Chicago forced me to learn and focus on a single area, where in the university I I took a lot of courses from all different angles. I was always interested in so many different types of courses, except math. I was interested in pretty much everything but math. I was just not a natural math person. So, I won't go through all of the story of what happened during graduate school or anything close to it, but I will tell you about my evolution in terms of learning various paths of counseling. One of the things I've found, it's sort of an anecdote, is whatever you are going through in person, it'll show up in your office. Or what you're going through shows up in your office. I landed my first counseling internship at Loyola University Chicago in the career counseling department. I was not excited about this at all. I didn't own a car at the time, and many of the internships that I applied for required driving because I really wanted to work with people who were financially destitute and severely mentally ill. I was interested in that. But I was strictly a Chicago Transit Authority rider on the bus and the trains at the time because I didn't have a car. So Loyola said, you don't have to have a car. You can just, we're right off the train stop. Just take that. Um, And uh, I thought, okay, what the heck? This sounds interesting. So I was not thrilled at the idea of career counseling. It sounded quite boring. But once again, we humans are full of judgments and assumptions, so I prove myself to be wrong. I find myself to be wrong about 95% of the time when I assume anything. I thoroughly enjoyed learning about the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the strong inventory, and the Enneagram test, which are some of the tools that Loyola's Career Development Center used um, with their students in workshops and in personal counseling, which was really cool. Um, What these tests revealed about personality and vocation was how to utilize uh, these assessments. So I learned about the value of meaningful work, the cultural differences of students whose parents demanded that they have a certain career, usually a doctor or a lawyer, how the economy affected work satisfaction, and many other factors. I was quite surprised at the things I learned uh, at the Career Development Center. Oddly, at the time, several of my friends and family members were struggling with their own careers and job shifts, uh, and even finding basic jobs, I was able to utilize some of the skills I had learned to steer them in the direction of inquiry and exploration. I was not able to, like, help them as a counselor. You know, I didn't offer them counseling. But by explaining some of the things I had learned in my career counseling experience, one of them actually found their first job uh, through the career fair at Loyola University and in Chicago, and he uh, stayed at the same company for 13 years and went from making $12 an hour to some really good salary. (laughs) And now he started his own business. So um, we always joke about that. I was like, hey, come to the career fair, because he didn't have a job. And then 13 years later, he's ascended pretty high in the company. Uh, Next year, you know, I took a job at Lutheran Social Services of Illinois and worked as a member of this team which tried to help people uh, not utilize the hospital and crisis services as much. So it was a combination of counseling and um, case management. Um, And we basically focused on people that were in the hospital a lot due to mental uh, crises. And we were working on the west side of Chicago, mostly some some on the south side, uh, but the far west side, which is quite impoverished. A lot of difficult things over there. I could probably do a whole podcast on the stories, uh, the things I learned there. But one of the things I learned was because we did about half home visits uh, a lot of the time. We were in the streets. We were in the field. And I learned that you could really learn a lot about the environment and and what the person's environment was like, if they lived with somebody, where they lived, um, and how this challenged them. And, you know, looking at photos in the house and learning more and more deeply about these clients, you could sort of learn things about their family tree and different things, even if they were suffering from psychosis and sometimes made up stories and you were really sure if these were true. Um, during that time, an interesting thing was the difference of opinion on how to address patients who may totally annoy you and frustrate you. Um, 
I remember uh, one of the psychiatrists I really liked, and one of them I wasn't too keen on, but the one I wasn't too keen on thought the answer to everything was injecting them with Risperidol um, in his office. Um, and not really just saying, well, they're crazy and psychotic, they need this, and then they'll function. And I mean, that's, you know, they had psychosis, a lot of them were suffering from that. And then also there was a break and a split on the team. Uh, a lot of the licensed professional counselors preferred doing motivational interviewing, and a lot of the social workers were all about consequences uh, and natural consequences. And I found this split in attitudes strange, and I remember thinking, well, they've already had consequences. I mean, they have had health consequences. They've had social consequences. A lot of these people just had as many consequences as you could have without being homeless. And some of them were homeless for a time or had been homeless multiple times. So clearly consequences were not working. You know, the mental illness had superseded their logic center um, in terms of learning how to navigate the modern world. And so at that time, I took a cue from a few licensed professional counselors in Chicago, and I started reading motivational interviewing. And uh, I found it amazing and very useful. So if any of you out there do not utilize this technique, it is fantastic. And I found that I was able to make a lot of um, progress with people that had been labeled, uh, you know, as basically somebody who couldn't make progress. And eventually I did a presentation for my entire staff on motiv motivational interviewing because I felt very passionately that we all needed to be utilizing some skills from this instead of just using the consequences model. Um, and most of all at Lutheran Social Services, I met some great people there. And one of my mentors that is still my mentor today, I met during the first few weeks that I worked there in 2007. And that is Rafe Adams. And you can hear him in Intentional Clinician Podcast, Episode 18. So, Again, what you find in your office shows up in your life, or what shows up in your life finds its place into your office. So as a therapist, I had family members at the time going through some actual crises, and I was able to share information about what I had learned by uh, working on the crisis team and doing in-home counseling and case management. And again, this helped them in their life by seeking appropriate levels of care. A series of events led me to leave Chicago and find my second job in Phoenix, Arizona. Again, I was terrified. I was sure I had just made a very large mistake. Just on a city level, I mean, there is no comparison between Phoenix and Chicago in my mind. I mean, Chicago is a much more mature and beautiful and vibrant city, and Phoenix is a newer city, and it's sprawling, and it's hot, and there's no real water source there, and... It seems like a place where people retire or hide from their lives. Um, of course, this is all projections, except for the water part. Um, however, Phoenix does have beautiful weather. I mean, people are attracted to that. It is pretty much gorgeous October through April 1st. Um, so there's always a balance to everything. Anyway, I ended up working for a social services agency once again, this time called Jewish Family and Children's Services of Arizona. I was this time working in a uh, almost more dangerous neighborhood than I had worked uh, in in Chicago uh, called Maryville. It is uh, highly gang infested and low um, high school graduate and attendance rate. And I worked with teenagers and their parents and even some adults. Again, I was thrust into another position, an area that I never wanted to work in, substance abuse counseling. I had absolutely no interest in this whatsoever. In fact, if there, we were to make a list of the different types of counseling concentrations, substance abuse counseling would have been on the absolute bottom. But I was, you know, not rich. I needed a job. I had no money. <laughs> so I only had the money that I moved there with. Uh, and so I ate humble pie and enrolled in the training for this. And I was trained in the Adolescent Community Reinforcement Approach, which was thought up by Dr. Robert Myers and Associates out of the University of New Mexico. So again, this was a serendipitous or synchronistic 
event. Uh, this method is amazing. And oddly, Dr. Robert Myers uh, shared a hallway with Dr. William Miller, who helped write Motivational Interviewing. They were actually friends. And a lot of the concepts from Motivational Interviewing are found in the entire program of the Adolescent Community Reinforcement Approach, otherwise known as ACRA. It's, it's pronouncing its acronym, ACRA. Uh, and at that time, oddly, once again, some people in my life and friends and my family were struggling with substance abuse. Perfect timing. I was able to pass on valuable information and resources to them. So, more thoughts on my time in psychotherapy. There's a quote I like. Don't believe everything you think. I'm not really sure who said this. I wrote anonymous in my notes. But um, it was written on the wall of a yoga studio that I attended in Phoenix. And I do believe that this is very true. We have thousands of thoughts a day, maybe millions. And a lot of them may have nothing to do with reality. And so just be careful what you believe. Examine your thoughts. Use meta-analysis. So what you think could be the result of various reasons in your life or because of circumstances or just your level of awareness, maybe your level of exposure to other people or other situations. It could be your actual cultural encapsulation. And trust me, we all have cultural encapsulation, uh, especially the longer you stay in one place and don't get out of your comfort zone, the more this you have. And then, oddly, the higher the walls are to experiencing it and the stronger the denial, usually. We all have thoughts because of traumas we've been through, grief we've been through, depression or anxiety or other things, uh, addictions, food addictions, whatever it is. We all struggle with understanding concepts, let alone how they apply to life. The hard part is admitting this, of course. Um, I'm hoping you're getting the drift that I don't think I know it all, but I'm telling you what I think I know, which may change. So podcast 20, remember, I'll probably change some of this later. So in my training and work in psychotherapy, I was led by a series of occurrences, or what seem what I would label synchronicities, into learning many different modes of therapy practices. So, you know, the odd cousins of motivational interviewing and ACRO, the Adolescent Community Reinforcement Approach. Um, I, I, was so, I was so at odds with this. It's kind of funny how chance brought me into this because I was so at odds with substance abuse therapy that I, I was just annoyed by the fact of having to be trained by it. But yet this therapy has helped me in so many ways with my regular therapy. I, you know, when you see the TV show or the picture, you don't think of traditional therapy. People with substance abuse often are being coerced into the therapy or they have a dual diagnosis and a biological addiction components, which make the counseling even more challenging. Plus, I had already had to deal with enough substance abuse issues in my own family, and I certainly didn't want to make a career out of it, because it is gut-wrenching and frustrating. Uh, yet, I didn't have much of a choice. I was trying to get my full license, and I was broke. So, I went to work for JFCS in West Phoenix. So, during the training of ACRA, I thought it was an interesting tool, but what set it apart from other models that I had learned in graduate school was what they called fidelity to the model. Uh, so I was required to record myself on audio tapes, conducting ACRA sessions with multiple clients, and I had to maintain the philosophical paradigm of ACRA while moving through various activities. And I know we'd all done taping of things before, but, you know, that was general counseling skills. This was, this was actually, you know, maintaining a paradigm and not shifting... Um, I had to pass over 12 tapes, and those had to be up to standards for those who had actually invented the program. I had to send these tapes to New Mexico. Some of these tapes I passed were, were activity-based, like the happiness scale, goal-setting, problem-solving, communication skills, relationship skills, family counseling, the functional analysis of substance abuse, the functional analysis of pro-social activities, anger management skills, job searching skills, and more. Although these were all done in a certain way that it was very... Um, open and, and directed towards adolescence. Um, we had to create a space and rapport for the client while also nudging them into exploratory counseling activities as well as role playing. I found that I was able to use my creativity and love for comedy and music in general to 
uh, draw the clients into role plays about communication, finding activities, and even how to refuse drugs, even if they didn't want to. It was funny. I just used a lot of absurd, zany stuff. I found new levels of authenticity to my clients' stories. I was actually intrigued by the people I was working with, um, and even though I didn't think I would like substance abuse counseling. I learned to work with people from many different backgrounds in this job, and they weren't all from substance abuse. I mean, some of them had been in CPS custody, child protective services, or they were the parents of them or foster parents. And I especially worked with a lot of young people that were mandated for treatment through probation, parole, and CPS. So I was also helping uh, people who were struggling not only with drugs and alcohol, but in addition to depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, family turf turmoil, difficult living environments, reactive attachment, um, different types of traumas, living in gang territories, poverty, general lack of safety. Uh, and this challenged my skills and stretched my knowledge of culture and human behavior. It helped me understand much better the gray areas of life, the complexity of all the choices, the environment, the nurturing versus nature, the genetic pro propensity in various spectrums of health versus unhealth that we're all facing all the time. But for five years, I pretty much immersed myself in this job. And it allowed me to move into a deeper awareness outside my comfort zone and learning to really understand the other instead of labeling them or having biased opinions. It paved the way uh, by chance. So eventually, I was given the opportunity, along with a few other of my colleagues, to become an ACRA trainer. And uh, I was so tired of the managed care environment that I decided, yeah, a teaching role sounds good. I'm, you know, burned out seeing 40 people a week. So um, then I had to coach different people and teach them on how to do the ACRA method and even record the audio tapes of me coaching them. And I had to also grade tapes of clinicians who had done ACRA sessions. And I had to grade them and get basically the same score within 5% that the trainers in New Mexico uh, were giving the clinicians. So this is very difficult. This took a long time. I think it took about eight months. And this helped me learn, again, another synchronistic event uh, that I love teaching uh, skills and concepts during role plays and uh, leading clinicians in experiential activities. It eventually led me to develop my own six-hour training entitled The Intentional Clinician, which I'm still giving today a couple times a year. Um, for six continuing education units. So if you want that at your clinic, let me know. Um, and I worked for five years in this position before I uh, went into private practice. And eventually I decided to continue uh, teaching the ACRA model a couple times a year, which I still do to this day when I go down to Phoenix. But I found that learning a training, uh, even if you're not into it, it offers coaching and listening to tapes. I gained a lot of feedback and um, I was able to work on my basic counseling skills as, as well. And uh, I think it's really important as a therapist and a clinician to get feedback. And I think because oftentimes, you know, we're doing our best job, and so we believe we're doing our best, but um, we could do better. I mean, there's other people that can listen and give us feedback, and we must be open to that. Otherwise, we'll fall into the... Uh, egocentric, arrogant therapist trap, and nobody wants that because you hear horror stories about that. So during this time, a curious thing I noticed about most of the adolescents and children I was working with was the prevalence of trauma and even post-traumatic stress disorder. So during this time, in about 2009, about one year into my stint with the ACRA program, I was given the opportunity to enroll in the EMDR training, Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing Therapy. Here's the truth. I thought that the EMDR training was going to be completely useless. Uh, I was just like, I don't even know. I guess I'll sign up for this because I'm tired and I would rather go to a training than be, you know, working another 40 hours here. So a colleague sent me articles and uh, actually Dr. Robert Roten did a training, uh, trauma training at our about how trauma affects the brain at our facility. And I, that kind of drew my interest. But my skepticism still followed me into the first training, and I didn't know that it would EMDR therapy would have the effect on me that it did. But my first teacher was Ana Gomez, who is a fantastic EMDR consultant and published author out of Phoenix, Arizona. 
And through this training, I was also reunited with Randy Webb, who you have heard in episode 14 of The Intentional Clinician, a brilliant man. And again, through this training, my personal life, someone very close to me had just gone through a series of traumatic events and developed PTSD. So lo and behold, right around this time, I was able to advise them to seek an EMDR therapist in their area. And I believe because of that therapy that they sought, they are still alive today and they are much uh, farther in the recovery from PTSD to the point where they're high, you know, pretty high functioning again. Let's put it this way. EMDR revolutionized my understanding of the human condition, of trauma, of mental illness, of emotional wellness, the nervous system, and what is really going on when people say, I just can't get over this. And um, I realize that working with some people with EMDR, they were able to quickly reduce their subjective, subjective units of distress to traumatic stimuli, and the PTS symptom, PTSD symptoms very quickly remitted in many people. They exited therapy soon and reported months later that they came in for a check and that they were still doing great. And they were able to uh, continue that. So I found that EMDR was awesome and I continue to use it to, to this day. But post EMDR treatment, even with the symptoms gone, a lot of people... Um, were unsure of how to behave now that their life wasn't plagued with PTSD symptoms. They had this strange sense of identity loss when the trauma symptoms had faded and their subjective units of distress had gone down. Um, a lot of them seemed to have what I call the CPTSD or complex post-traumatic stress disorder, and they were unsure to even trust in themselves or their decisions. Or... They might be filled with a sense of meaningless now that they were not being plagued by the symptoms. They were just had been used to it for so long to this coping method that they had developed. So uh, essentially, I started learning more about narrative therapy and existential therapy, which I'll discuss in detail coming up in the second part of the podcast. Um, and from EMDR, it, it just snowballed into learning about narrative therapy, existential therapy, depth psychology, um, myth-making, storytelling, uh, and learning how to take risks and implement major life changes post-traumatic recovery. And helping people move into realms of getting in tune with what they actually want and then making it happen in a way that's not forceful or judgy. Uh, and, you know, just a little bit more before I get into the deep parts about psychotherapy, a little bit more about my life. Uh, I first began my private practice in 2013, and I, again, needed something to supplement my income, so I applied for an adjunct teaching position at Grand Canyon University. And I was able to make a lot of friends there and learn a lot uh, instructing students in, in uh, how to become a counselor. Dr. Noe Vargas actually is one of the friends I made there, and you can hear him talk about treating trauma in immigrant populations in episode eight of the intentional clinician. And I founded a private practice called intentional counseling services. And I made great friends, uh, with people like Courtney and Brian and Sarah and Maxine and, uh, Brian Sabatino of inner work counseling is, um, featured in episodes six and seven of the intentional clinician as he talks about mindfulness meditation and philosophy and recovery from substance use. Sarah Jenkins, um, who I'm hoping to interview someday, is an EMDR consultant and equine therapy expert. Maxine Norris and her husband, Scott, are fantastic, amazing therapists. Maxine is an advocate for women. She does these Arizona women's therapy groups. And Scott Henderson is a fantastic gestalt therapist that still practices in the traditional ways, obviously his own interpretations as well. While I was in private practice, I took a supervisor training, and I was actually offered a opportunity to be a supervisor for a place called the Shanti Group, which is a specialty clinic specializing uh, in helping people who are suffering from HIV and AIDS and complex trauma. Um, though I was only their uh, temporary supervisor until the director got certified, that was an amazing experience. And through that, I became a temporary supervisor for all of the therapists working at the Southwest Center for HIV and AIDS when one of their supervisors had to suddenly quit their job. So I was there for about three months. That was kind of interesting as well, learning a lot about that population. 
And then through conversations with friends and colleagues, I began to move more into incorporating a lot of different types of therapy. I'm incorporating motivational interviewing. I'm incorporating ACRA. I'm incorporating client-centered humanistic. I'm incorporating solution-focused. I'm incorporating psychoeducational and EMDR, and then eventually narrative existential. And then I'm incorporating depth and transpersonal psychology. And depth and transpersonal psychology is more what I'm into now, but I am always seeing what the patient needs first. And so I consider those deeper realms of therapy. And so therefore I, I often just start with where the person's at and the appropriate level of care, which I'll get into. So a question for everyone out there, how often are we listening? And what I mean by that is not only to others, but to our inner voice. I often think we aren't listening to others at all, and that's a big challenge uh, in our personal lives to, to really listen to somebody deeply. But are we listening to our own inner voice? I think it starts with us. This inner voice comes to you in dreams. It comes to you while you are quiet for sustained periods of time. It comes to you for when you have prolonged exposure in a natural environment without distracting stimuli. This voice can be something you listen to in your mind, or even if you focus on your body and breathing, sometimes you hear this voice. And it shows up in daytime imaginative visions, it shows up in dreams. So a sign I remember, just an example of this, was uh, when I was in college, I had this weird vision where I wanted to create a place where people could just come in and tell their story. I had this idea while working for a coffee shop. And I remember there were certain people that would come into this coffee shop and get the smallest and absolutely cheapest coffee, which I think was 50 cents, just a black coffee. And they would just come and just talk to the staff behind the counter as much as they could. They wouldn't really go sit down. They'd stand over by the corner. And as soon as there wasn't a rush, they would just talk to our staff and just chat and chat and chat about their lives and tell us about their dogs or tell us about their house or tell us about whatever. And I remember we were open a 24-hour day coffee shop. And I remember sometimes working on the night shift different people from the neighborhood would come in and I, I'm assuming again, I'm usually wrong, but I think this time I was right that they were feeling lonely. And I remember one of the coworkers of mine, he would, he would give this old man a hug every time the, the gentleman came into our coffee shop and he, the old man would just light up. Um, he, he seemed to be sad. I don't think he, I don't know. He seemed quite sad. I remember my friend telling me a story, which I can't remember right now. Um, but I just thought, what if what if I created a place someday, this is a daydream I had, where people could just come in and talk and just be themselves. Um, but oddly, I didn't even connect that this idea was related to counseling. I was thinking more of a public restaurant or coffee shop or a place where people could have community. Um, I never thought someday I would be a professional counselor who would help people come in and talk about their lives and hopefully leave feeling more aligned with purpose and meaning on a path of healing or just more like themselves. But I just wanted people to be able to be themselves in a place that felt safe. And this is before I really knew anything about psychology. Counseling does a great service with the individual and the family and the privacy of its boundaries. Humans, though, are wired for community. I don't think we as a culture have really mastered what it is to have intimacy on a community level. There are still so many levels of exclusivity, ego, uh, overindulgence in the ego, um, money concerns involved whenever people join together in a group. Maybe this is just something we have to put up with. Maybe this is part of the human condition. Yet people have made attempts at creating intentional communities, and you can read about those you know, in books and online. Perhaps I believe that inside any community, there can be a space for authentic sharing and relationships. Yet, if such a space is to be developed, there must be stewards or guides and agreed upon rules. I learned that from Parker Palmer. Such a space could be the subject of the entire podcast episode or book, so I'm not going to attempt this. But I am going to repeat that humans are social creatures and need some level of community where they can be safe, feel safe to be themselves. If a community space is functions on a strange individual agendas or follows some sort of construct of belief and the space is not being stewarded by rules or authentic sharing is not encouraged, but such language is labeled and dismissed, then once pure ideas and spaces can devolve into toxic environments that are restrictive, shallow, are full of ego battles, are 
are even cult-like. And the scary part is you may not even know if you're in one of these because a lot of times these places use flowery language um, and doctrinal terms um, and use a lot of fear tactics, uh, such as if you think outside of the box or outside of a certain way of interpreting something, then you are actually a bad person, you're lost sheep, you're a heretic, um, you're just uh, don't know poor you will, you know, will think about you in our prayers, all this sort of thing. So a lot of us have experience with some type of organized structure, whether it be a church or a business or working for government or working for a school uh, that did not protect the sharing spaces uh, where people were sharing with agreed upon rules or an overseer. Um, but trusted people led these places based on their perceived authority, their age, their title, or some agreed upon belief system, or just somehow they got into power. And these spaces, we may have been in these spaces, we may have been wounded or felt betrayed or even exploited. And many have stories to tell. In these spaces, we may have been uh, subject to something I call sanctuary trauma, where we're hurt inside a place that is supposed to be quote unquote safe. At times, it appears easier that some people in small groups or pairs can achieve a level of safety and authenticity such as in a close friendship or a partnership. However, these type of deep relationships take an investment, sacrifice, risk, and a great deal of personal and group work to sustain. Such close devotion to the other requires being in touch with one's own feelings and thoughts and not being afraid to share them with the other person. The other person must be able to hold a space for whatever comes from their partner or friend with as little judgment as possible, or if we hear judgment, to dismiss it, because we're often wrong. And we have to understand the universal human condition that we're all making mistakes all the time and we don't always say what we mean and we don't always respond appropriately. There has got to be a level of grace and forgiveness in this. And if an argument or dispute happens, being able to repair and renew and redeem the relationship through restorative and reparative work that is not power-based, it's got to be an equal playing field. It is work. It is both inner work and our personal self and our partnership work. So in therapy, a space should be created where the client is able to be him or herself with as free a judgment as possible. And in that space, therefore, they may confront their deepest fears, their past wounds, their depressions, their anxieties, their existential concerns, doubts, regrets. They may have a space to start making intentional choices toward a new way of living and being and not feel like a failure when the inevitable difficulties of life arise. They won't have to label things in binary categories of good or bad. This relationship, the therapeutic one, is one-sided. It's different than the community thing I was talking about earlier or the close partnership. Um, because the therapist must put down their own personal opinions as much as possible and open up to the differences of the other. The therapist must be aware of their countertransference or feelings about the other person in the room and find a way to process these outside of the client's therapy hour and outside of their space. This is very difficult work, to be sure. Yet, if the therapist can maintain this perspective, they will be able to provide what we can label as a container for the client to be safe and do their own inner work. The whole point of this eventually is that the person regains a sense of self or whatever they're going through or feels better or is you know, healed in some way so that they can go out of the therapy room and out of the therapy practice and out of the doctor's office and out of these places and out of the retreat center and back into their community and their relationships and behave in a manner where they are aware of their pitfalls and their own shadows, while also working for levels of contentment and change, and not just accepting the status quo. For me, the vision I had in college of the place where people could come and be themselves did not tell me I would be a counselor. My journey to becoming a counselor was long and a winding road full of strange meetings, small failures, self-doubt, existential angst at midnight, and more. It was an experience that was more important than what I thought. The experience was not just my thoughts. It was the great teacher and also the transformer. Thoughts can lead and mold in certain repetitive patterns, but an experience can change someone completely. For me, 
I used to think that concepts or belief systems were the most important part of therapy, but only through experience did I change, and therefore I aim to create experiences for my clients in my office. I do not beat the drum of concept with my clients as much as possible. And if I have, I'm sorry. I'm sure I've had a day where I've done that. I try to create experiences for my clients in my office, whether through different exercises that I've developed or read about or utilized or learned from other master therapists, mindfulness activities, EMDR, and even using CBT as an experience instead of pounding it as a concept. It is focusing less on what is, quote, true or factual due to certain cultural viewpoints and more on the individual observations of the person, letting them free themselves from the binary of black and white and finding their space between the black and white, in the gray, in the color spectrum, in the rainbow. Of course, we must keep in this sort of, you know, flowery thing I'm talking about, we have to understand basics of science how interpersonal neurobiology, which is a whole system of uh, observation combining neurology with biology with psychology, biology, such as the effects of vitamin D and magnesium on our systems or fast food on our systems, truths about the mind and facts about the nervous system at hand, we must understand this as well to provide a framework or scaffold, um, you know, to the therapy. We have to understand the science here so we can do the art Thus, some of the therapy can seem like psychoeducation and learning just about the basic human organism and psychoeducation about philosophy. But we do this to help the client develop a new level of awareness. And I find that when clients learn about their system as a human and they learn about psychology or, or philosophy and they learn about human history and that other people are also experiencing things like this, there is so much shame and guilt that is lifted because I don't know why, but there's a huge part of our culture that I think is self-loathing, whether they're comparing themselves to people in the media, on television and social media, and feeling less than, or they're comparing themselves to people in their neighborhood, or people at their school, or people at their workplace, or if they're comparing themselves to some sort of idealized fantasy brought in by different, uh, you know, experiences in organizations. Uh, people don't understand the human uh, experience as much from a, a larger perspective, and therefore they're in pain. So not that we'll ever fully understand it, but once it's partially understood, experiential exercises can alter one's trajectory and open up to greater levels of consciousness and, and awareness. As a young person, I never knew what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted to do something to help people. Enneagram 2, wing 3 anyone <laughs> who knows about that. I wanted to know what I would do, like most people. I really just wanted to know what it was when I was young. And this led to, you know, I was trying to reduce my anxiety and satisfy my personal human need for control. But as humans, the truth is we have very little control over much in our lives. Yet with little choices, small steps, we can walk through the fog with a small lantern guiding our feet without falling too much. And thus, if you follow your vision of what you want to do and bring into the world, it and if you are open to it, and if you are willing to go through what it takes, it will bring, which you can't know in advance, by the way, it will bring you through inexplicable, inexplicable, if I could pronounce things, happenings. But it always brings you to the next place you need to be, even if you fall down a well. That might be necessary. I'm not in control. I'm not making this up. This is just what happens. I'm still trusting today that as my psychotherapy practice evolves into its 11th year, um, that I'm still in the dark. I still, I, I've, I've learned, I'm about to, the next part of the podcast is what I'm about to go into where I go through all these different modalities of therapy. And I still, I, I can't say that I know even close to everything about this field. I don't think I ever will. I never knew I could achieve having my own counseling clinic and being licensed in two states and training people. But I kept going and I kept trying, even though I felt like a failure before and I messed up things and I didn't do things right. So I'm open to what the interesting work that I'm doing will lead me to next. 
um, Carl Jung said, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about us, I'm talking about you, I'm talking about me. Carl Jung said, if the path before you is clear, you're probably on someone else's. So if the path before you is clear, you're probably on someone else's. I'm just going to leave that right there. Uh, I think that's obvious. Like every time I think I know where I'm going, then experience and different happenings in my life prove me wrong. And here's our segue into the next section. Are we interested? There was never yet an uninteresting life. Such a thing is an impossibility. Inside of the dullest exterior, there is a drama, a comedy, and a tragedy. Mark Twain. At times in our lives, we all become tired. This is a sign of something. It may be the sign of a need of renewal. It may be a sign that our habits in our community are having some type of effect on us that is causing a spiritual, emotional, mental, or physical fatigue. Without much variety, sometimes life can seem tiring and monotonous, but oftentimes with too much variety and, quote, wanderlust, life can feel confusing and chaotic. We must learn to live in the tension of the opposites. And so, of course, psyche being the word for soul, uh, what does the soul need in psychology? The question is ever-changing, yet it probably needs something at different times and another thing at another time. It needs something more in the middle between the rigid patterns of sameness, tradition, and personal or group rituals, and the need for different, diverse perspectives, shaking it up, travel, new experiences, reading new books, or learning something outside of our comfort zone. It needs challenges. Yet it needs a place to lay on the couch and watch Netflix sometime. Do you hear me? <laughs> As a therapist, I find it important that I have both rituals that are grounding for me and personal and group traditions that keep me interested in each person's unique story and personhood. Yet at the same time, I must challenge myself to find time to spend outside of my comfort zone, work on my own shadow projections and difficulties, find times for healthy mind activities, Finding some type of community that speaks to me, which for counselors and therapists can be a difficult uh, prospect. I have to have time for diverse experiences and moving outside of my culture of origin and to not get too comfortable with my belief systems, no matter how right I think I am. And remember that experience reveals more than do concepts on paper. How does one balance this? Well, it's impossible to balance this. There is no such thing as perfection that is achievable in this realm of experience. But I find that there are cyclical patterns and walls I will hit when I am on too much of one side of the spectrum than the other. For instance, there are times where I'll be traveling for one or two weeks in a row or weekends or whatever, and I find myself exploring and learning and going into the flow and diving into new experiences, and yet... During this time, I find myself sometimes disconnected from my inner process or personal relationships. Then I'll return. I'll stop traveling. I'll be in my routine of work and play and sleep. And I find myself going to work, going to exercise class, working on relationships, playtime, creativity, music. None of that is any is ever balanced. There's always things coming up, but... It is my awareness that I need balance that leads me to the next choice, the next right choice. Yet, wrong choices work too, because experience will let you know. It always does, if we're truly listening to what's going on. Something struck me on this concept of balance when I was reading The Pocket Guide to Interpersonal Neurobiology by Dr. Dan Siegel, MD. Uh, Dr. Siegel, of course, is working on merging neuroscience research with counseling, psychology, and other parts of functional medicine, which you can read about the Norton series on interpersonal neurobiology. According to Dr. Siegel, there are elements he found that uh, lead to a healthy mind, and this is based on research. But I'm just, for the highlights, going to read you the seven things 
him and some other doctors decided were mental, quote, nutrients for optimal mental well-being. Sleep time, physical time, focus time, time in, meaning like reflecting on your inner thoughts and feelings, downtime, play time, and connecting time with others. So let's go backwards. Connecting time, we need time that's social. Play time, we need to do something expressive and fun. Remember when kids just wanted to play? When we were little, we just wanted to play. Downtime, that means we actually, the picture is somebody uh, leaning against a palm tree. And this doesn't just mean updating your social media. Time in, reflecting. How often are we reflecting? I don't think very often. Focus time, we're focusing on something. This could be work or a project or whatever. Physical time, exercise, and sleep time. So how much of us are even balancing some of those, let alone all seven? That's something to think about. And that leads me to part two of today's podcast. I'm labeling this part, Enough About Me. No, or subtitle, Reflections on My Experiences with Different Modalities of Therapy and Their Implications. That concludes part one of my reflections on 10 years of providing psychotherapy. Stay tuned for the next release, which will be part two, where I explain my reflections on various modalities of therapy and their implications for treatment. In the second half, it is much less about my life and much more about learning about different modalities such as Um, talking about existential psychotherapy, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR therapy, narrative processes, depth psychology takes up a good portion of it, mindfulness, stages of change, levels of care. So I go over a lot of things I learned in brief in the next podcast, which is part two. And that will be out in about 30 days from when this one was released. So thanks for listening. Again, this has been Paul Krauss, the licensed professional counselor and host of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I am currently in Grand Rapids, Michigan, though I do consulting uh, for behavioral health companies and trainings out of state, mostly centered in Arizona right now, where I also have a license. Um, If you're in need of counseling, don't hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You could also make an appointment with somebody I work with here in Grand Rapids. That information is on healthforlifegr.com or search Health for Life Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's where we're at. Or paulkrauscounseling.com. I also have a supervisory group, and you can find out more about that at counselingsupervisorgr.com. And if you want to email me, my email is on those websites. About any trainings you want me to do, I can do custom trainings as well. Now for the disclaimer. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss, and while these are based on the literature he has read and his experience in the field, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on the subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please call 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line, 1-800-273-8255. If you're looking for a counselor, I recommend going to American Counseling Association and looking up a counselor in your area, Psychology Today or EMDR.com. Those are all good places to start. Looking for a licensed professional counselor in your area. Thanks so much for listening. Take care, everybody.